and I want to say on behalf of Betsy and her sons and their families, and Suzanne and their family members, thank you for being here this day. It is no secret that the circumstances that cause us to gather are in many ways very, very tragic circumstances. And uh, I just want to say on behalf of the family, thank you so much for all of the support that you guys have been showing to them uh, in these difficult times. I want to say a special thank you to folks who are gathered here today, uh, folks from many different churches, folks from Grace Community Church from the old days, and currently from Crossroads Community Church, from Placery Baptist. Thank you guys for coming out and for the beautiful flowers. Folks from Church of the Canyons, thank you for being here today. And uh, old timers from Crown Valley Community Church, thank you guys for being here today. Thank you for all of the family and friends who have uh, flown in from far away uh, to be with Betsy and, and the family. I want to begin with a reading of scripture from Psalm 46, verse 11, verses 1 through 11. The psalmist says there that God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth should change, or though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea. You know, in the worst of life's turmoils, God is a refuge, God is a strength. Though its waters roar and foam, and though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. And there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. And he raised his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come and behold the works of the Lord, who has wrought desolations on the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. And the psalmist ex exhorts us with these words. He says, cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Would you bow with me as we open in prayer today? <coughs> Father in heaven, we want to say thank you for this day and for this opportunity that we have to gather in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to come alongside Betsy and the boys and their families, and Susan and their families, Lord, and to comfort and encourage them. Lord, you know that there are many things, many questions that are unanswered, many things that plague our hearts, many things that, are, that challenge our understanding of the scriptures. And Lord, yet, in all of this, we have to be reminded that you are God and we are not, that your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts are higher than ours, Lord. And the secret things belong to you. But the things that you have revealed to us, Lord, those things belong to us and our generations forever that we may do them, Lord. So we thank you that we have a clear record that you are not a God who is caught off guard, that you are not a God who simply responds to circumstances. You are not a God who merely makes lemonade out of lemons, Lord, but you are a God who is in sovereign control. And not only are you sovereign, Lord, but you are wise. You are merciful. You are loving, Lord. And you choose the best means to accomplish your ends and your purposes. And so on the one hand, it is hard for us to, to gather here today and to look in the eyes of one another and in some ways to struggle to find words to express that we really believe that all of these things are working together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. And yet, Lord, we have the rock-solid confidence of the revelation of 
your very self in your word that tells us, Lord, that you are on your throne, even in times where the very earth itself should change and the mountains themselves slip into the heart of the sea when the waters roar and foam, the mountains quake. You alone, Lord God, are our refuge and our strength. And so, Lord, we ask that your spirit would come alongside all those who know you today, Lord God, that, that you would be our very present help in times of trouble, Lord. Lord God, for those who today here are, look at this as an opportunity to mock the faith. Lord, we pray that instead what they might be met with is a message of, of grace and mercy. Lord, that they might see themselves not as ones who stand in judgment of the sins and failings of another, Lord, but they would be the ones who see themselves in need of mercy because they stand condemned before a holy God. It is all of our lot because we are all sinners. Lord, for those who are weak and who are struggling, help them to be reminded again, Lord, that we should never put our faith and our trust in a mere man. Because at the end of the day, Lord, that you are jealous for our affections. We must put our faith and our trust in you. All of our sin, all of our failings only seeks to amplify the reality that we are sinners in need of a Savior. And so we thank you, Jesus, that you have shed your blood on the cross for our sins. And we pray, Lord God, that you would be glorified somehow through the ministry of your word and the testimony that is given today, Lord. Father, we pray for, for Betsy and just ask that you would come alongside her. Father, we pray for Kevin and Lisa and their family, Lord God, that you would comfort them. Lord, for Matt and Jamie, that you would bless them, Lord, for traveling so many miles to be together. Lord, that you would give them wisdom for Phil, Lord God, thank you that he could be here today. We pray, Lord God, that you would encourage and bless him. And for Andrew, Lord, we thank you for his sweet spirit. And pray, Lord God, that you would bless him ab abundantly. Father, we pray for Suzanne and ask, Lord God, that you would comfort her, that you would comfort the heart of a mother who's lost a son. And for Alicia, for Jason, Lord, for Kenny and for all of those who are suffering the loss of family. Father, we thank you for Jan and Missy and Don that they could be here with us today. Lord, thank you for the sacrifices that they've made to come alongside of Betsy and the kids. And so, Lord Jesus, again, we just throw ourselves on your mercy. We ask that your spirit would work in our hearts. We recognize, Lord, that there are many of us who have not seen one another's faces for years and years, Lord. And we just pray that in, in this day and this time, Lord God, and through these circumstances, that you would remind us all of the things that are real and the things that are true and the things that are eternal. And Lord God, that this would be a day of, of healing for many. That this would be a day of reconciliation for many. That this would be a day where your glory is put on display. Lord, we thank you for Dennis. We thank you for his life. And we thank you for the many ways that our lives have been impacted for good and for the gospel of Christ because of your grace in his life. It's hard for us, Lord. It's hard for us right now to get our arms around all of this. And then, Lord, we recognize that in the end, you are the one who is in control, Lord, and you are the one to whom the glory is due. And so it's our desire to bring the glory and honor to you. And so, Jesus, we thank you for being here. And we thank you that we have the privilege of gathering together with the saints today, with your children, with the family of God, to be comforted by one another and comforted, comforted by your word. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Thank you for praying with me. Uh, it is a it is a it is a pathetic understatement to say that it is a tragic thing 
to lose one to an untimely death. And what's more, when that person takes their own life, the natural questions are always there, right? What happened? How did we get to this place? Why? Betsy has communicated to most everyone that the family is not left with the normal questions concerning suicide. However, that being said, I've been asked by the family just to say to, to you and to myself that because of the really personal and sensitive nature of the circumstances that are led up to Dennis's passing, the Durer family asks that you would respect the privacy that you guys would refrain from inquiring concerning the details. That being said, they want for me to communicate to you how much they really appreciate all of your love. The phone calls and emails, the texts that you guys have sent, the meals that you've provided for them, child care and prayers have been a tremendous comfort and blessing. Betsy, we are very thankful to have that privilege to come alongside you guys. You can just look around and see all these people who are here. And they're here because they love you. And they're here because they want to comfort and encourage you. So we're grateful for you and we're grateful for your family. And we're grateful for Dennis and what he meant to us. To begin our service today, Betsy had chosen a song that was very uh, precious to her. It's a song that way back in 1996, she describes that she and, and Dennis, her two very dear friends at Grace Community Church, sing this song. The name of the song is called, When Praise Demands a Sacrifice. And she's chosen this song today to be played because the lyrics speak of worshiping Christ even when the dearest things in life have been taken. Just take a moment and enjoy. Oh. 
gave the stand. Um, um, that song has just meant so much to me through the years, and that's the first time I ever listened to it, and I didn't cry. <laughs> um, I'm in another dimension. I'm just, this whole thing has just put me in a place I can't even describe. Um, most of you know that I was a widow before. This is the second time that I have been a widow, but it's totally, totally different for many reasons. Um, under the circumstances of what led us to today, I didn't know what should be said, and I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't sure, but I thought, what is the very best thing that Dennis Durr has ever done for me? And that was an easy decision. Dennis led me to the Lord. Um, in August of 1989, Dennis became a believer. That's when he committed his life to Jesus Christ. And he was driving in his car and he was listening to the radio and he was listening to the Bible Answer Man and he was talking about John chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then he skipped down to verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And Dennis went, ding, 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 ding. Wait a minute. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus. And if the Word is Jesus, then Jesus is God. And in August of 89, Dennis committed his life to the Lord. In August of 1989, that's when my first husband and... Um, Kevin, 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 Matthew, they were two and eight years old at that time. And um, that was 1990. I was 29 years old and my... Husband Joe was 32 and he died of malignant melanoma. But in August of 89, he was diagnosed with brain tumors. And so um, we knew that soon he would probably die, and he did. And after he died, I wondered where he was. Why? I was uh, raised in a Jewish home, and I was um, mainly an atheist. I didn't believe in God, and I didn't care about God. And if you would have tried to tell me about him, I would have told you to shut up. <laughs> That's true. Um, and so, but then Joe was gone, and where did he go, and why, does, why do people say at funerals that he went to be with the Lord? Says who? Who goes to hell then? Uh, does everybody go to heaven? Seems like everybody believes that everybody goes to heaven. Everyone wants to believe that their loved ones are in heaven. But I didn't understand. I didn't know anything about the Word of God and what it really says, what God said about what happens to you when you die. So, Joe died in February of 1990, and in August of 1990, there was a knock at my door. Now normally, if I looked out my little peephole and I saw what I thought were Jehovah's Witnesses, I would <laughs> never answer the door. But I looked out my people and I see this lovely woman standing there with her daughter and I didn't see her briefcase. So I opened it. I'll never forget what she said to me. She says, Do you think that God has forgotten about us in the way that the world is today? That question would apply today too. Um, and I thought, you know, I don't know. I don't care. I said, but what do you guys think happens to people when they die? And oh, were they so happy and more than happy to come in and tell me all about it. And they came to my house at least twice a week for a couple hours at a time for about two months. Um, sorry, it's hard for me to keep my thoughts straight. Um, let me think. Hold on. I know this story. Um, <laughs> what happened next? <laughs> So my husband Joe was at um, Valley Presbyterian Hospital for three out of six of the last months of his life. And while we were spending all this time in the hospital, I got to know a family, um, Jan and Don Burke, and their son Scott. Scott. Scott was 26 years old and dying of leuke leukemia lymphoma. Um, and I knew that they were Christians. And um, I got to know Scott pretty well. 
and so he died six months after my Joe died, and I called his mother up about, I got to know her pretty well, and I called her about a week after Scott died to see how she was doing, you know. Hi Jan, how are you doing? Well Betsy, Don and I, we have peace. We have peace. And I'm thinking, peace? Joe's been dead for six months, I have no peace. What is she talking about, peace? And so I thought, you know, she's a Christian, I knew she was a Christian, I thought she'd be thrilled to know that I was studying with the Jehovah's Witnesses. So I'm like, Jan, <laughs> Jan, you'll never believe it, but I'm studying with the Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, her reaction wasn't what I expected. She said, no, Betsy, no, they're a cult, they're a cult. And she's like, she's like, um, she said, I don't know what they teach very well. And she goes, Scott could have, could have told you but would you be willing to hear the true gospel from some of his friends? And I said, sure. I couldn't say no to a woman whose son just died a week ago. And so I went to Jan Burke's house and I had my stack of Watchtower books, you know, like this high. And um, I come in to Jan's house and she had invited this guy, Mark Stang, to witness to me. And they all went to um, church at Rocky Peak. And so I come in and there's this guy who's got this video. It's called Witnesses of Jehovah. It was a Jehovah's Witness busting video. And um, <laughs> that guy put the video in the VCR. And I started watching this video. And um, I'm watching it, and there w they were two former uh, Jehovah's Witnesses who had come out of Jehovah's Witnesses and got saved and became true believers in Christ. And I'm listening to their testimonies, and I'm like, wow, that sounds really good. And I thought, if these guys are telling the truth, then I need to burn this stack of Watchtower material. But I wasn't convinced that they they were telling the truth, and so. Um, in the meantime, I have to back up just a second, because while I'm watching this video, the guy who put it in the machine, he's sitting over out of my peripheral vision, and his leg is just, you know, <laughs> doing this, and he's like all jumping around. I'm just wanting to reach over and just, would you please sit still? <laughs> and that guy was Dennis Durr. <laughs> my, first, my first impression of Dennis Durr was the guy cannot sit still. <laughs> Um, Dennis was always, just a side note, I was thinking about, you know, every time it was time to pray in church, that was the time Dennis would crack all ten of his knuckles. <laughs> it's true! I mean, he had these, anyway, that was just a side note. Um, um, so, that's how I met Dennis Durr. And so, now I go back to the Jehovah's Witnesses, and I'm like, okay, I watched this video, and they're, they're like, well, their answers were, were perfect. They had the perfect answer for every question I had. So then I went back to Dennis, and he had become now my Bible answer man. I'm like, okay, well, you tell me this, but they said this, and I'm back and forth and back and forth between Dennis and the Jehovah's Witnesses, and I was like, ah, I'm never going to get this. I don't even know why I'm doing this. I always hated, hated Jesus Christ, and I did not understand why. Why am I even doing this? I don't get it. Um, and Dennis said, why don't you come to church with me? And he, um, at that time, went to Grace Community Church. And on October 7th, 1990, I went to Grace Community Church. And um, he took me to this room. And there were all these people in this room. And they started coming up to me and they're like, oh, we've been praying for you. <laughs> How do you even know who I am? And <laughs> Dennis told us about you in, in Bible study. I'm like, okay. And I'm looking around this room and I'm like, Dennis, is this a singles group? <laughs> Some working disciples, where are you? I know you're out there. Yay! <laughs> um, I was so uncomfortable. I'm like, oh no. I didn't feel like I fit in. I'm a widow. I had two kids and all these people are single. I'm like, get me out of here. I really was so uncomfortable. But everyone was so kind to me and they were so nice to me. I'm like, wow, these people are really nice and they've been praying for me. 
So, I go into the big service. Now, if you've ever been to Grace Community Church, it's like huge. And I'm sitting in this church, and it's Communion Sunday at this church. And Dennis, he says, lunges me, and he's like, Now, Betsy, you can't take communion because you haven't received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'm like, that's okay. I tried that in the Catholic Church when I was a kid, and um, I got in a whole lot of trouble for it. <laughs> and so my curiosity for taking communion, I thought, was quelled, you know. But then they started passing these plates around and everyone's holding this little thing in their hand and I'm thinking, wow, they've got something I don't have. And I wasn't thinking about that wafer they were holding in their hand. I thought, these people know God and I don't. And I thought that all eyes were on me, kind of like right now. <laughs> That's what it felt like. And I, I just wanted to crawl into the pew and leave. I thought for sure everyone in there could tell that I was not a Christian. And then Dennis had this brilliant idea. Oh, and I started to cry. And Dennis was like, yeah, good, she's crying. That's a good sign. <laughs> wasn't a date. We weren't dating yet. Um, so then Dennis thought it would be a brilliant idea that for me to be introduced to John MacArthur. And I didn't know John MacArthur from The Man on the Moon, but um, I've got, he was nine now, and he was three. So I take my nine-year-old and my three-year-old, and Dennis drags me in there. John, this is Betsy. How you doing? Betsy's studying to become a Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> we're, we're really glad you're here, John says. And he, he didn't let go of my hand. He keeps shaking my hand. <laughs> Matthew goes behind him, three years old, and he takes John's punch. John had some red Grace Community Church punch. And Matthew takes his punch and starts walking away with his punch. I'm like, oh, no. John's like, oh, that's okay. I can get another one. And um, then John turns to this guy nine years old. He says, so son, did you enjoy your day at church today? And Kevin says, well, my Sunday school class was okay, but when we, when we went in that big church, that guy was really boring. <laughs> I taught him never to lie. Um, <laughs> to run out of that place so fast, I couldn't get out of there fast enough. And, but that night, that very night, I was jumping on the trampoline in my backyard in Valencia. And you cannot see the stars too well in Valencia. Does, can anybody, does anybody live in Valencia? See, do you see the whole display of stars every night out in your backyard? You can't see them very well, right? It's kind of dark. I mean, it's kind of too light to see the dark sky. But that night, that night, God put out a display of stars like I never remember seeing in Santa Clarita, ever. And I'm jumping on the trampoline and I'm screaming and crying and I'm a crazy woman and I'm like, God, I don't understand what's going on here. I do not know why I am seeking after you. Thinking, you know, it was me doing the seeking, not him, but um, I didn't get it yet and I, I didn't understand it all. And I'm jumping, and I'm jumping, and I'm crazy woman, and I'm praying, and I'm giving God an ultimatum. I don't suggest you do that, but he, he was um, <laughs> very, very gracious to me that night. I said, okay, God, you better reveal the truth to me or I'm giving up this search. And I looked up at those stars in the sky, and I thought, I, I just hear myself thinking, you know, there's no way that chaos could create such order. Like, those stars hang up there 365 days a year perfectly in their courses above. And all of a sudden I heard myself saying a verse, one verse that the Jehovah's Witnesses taught me that is true. Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And that started sinking in from the top of my head, you know, and I'm like, wow, I never believed God created the earth before, but all of a sudden I'm thinking, I think I believe that. God created the world. And then I'm jumping, I'm still jumping on the trampoline, don't forget, I'm jumping on the trampoline. <laughs> and, and I'm jumping. <laughs> and then I heard myself thinking, and Jesus is God. God created the world, and Jesus is God. That's it. That's it. I think I'm becoming a Christian right now. And um, Dennis had written me out a sinner's prayer in case I ever got to this point. 
And I thought there was magic in these words, but they were written in a notebook that was inside my house, and I'm outside on the trampoline, and I'm like, oh, but I gotta pray, I gotta pray right now! And, and so I just fell on my knees and I prayed, and, and um, I went in and checked the words later, and I, I did okay. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I fell on my knees and I prayed, and I asked Jesus to forgive me for all my sins and to be my Lord and Savior. And I got up from my knees on the trampoline, and I'm standing there, and this peace of God. Remember my friend Jan, whose son Scott died, and she was talking about that peace that she had, that peace of God which surpasses all comprehension that will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It flooded me. It flooded me from the top of my head to the tips of my toes, and I knew right then and there, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that I had just gotten saved. I had just become a Christian. I ran in the house and I called Dennis. Dennis, guess what? And I, he said I got an answering machine, but that's not true. He, he answered, and, and I made a few more phone calls, and um, I just started this new life in Christ, and it totally changed everything about my life. And um, I started going to classes, Bible classes, um, growing kids God's way. I was at church every time the doors were open. Um, I started taking Logos classes. And I know my friend Logan Carr is out there somewhere. <laughs> and she, there with her little laptop, I think she was the first person ever at Grace that ever put notes on a laptop. And, um, oh, and I have to say, I'm, I'm totally losing my train of thought, but Bob and Carol Turner are here. I was blown away that they came here for this service. I haven't seen them in forever, and they moved away, and they're here. And one thing that I tell people all the time, Carol, when I first got into this singles group, you know, I thought, I'm never going to get remarried. All these Christian guys, all they want is some girl, you know, who's, uh, can I just say, a virgin. And I was a widow with two kids. I was like, none of these guys are ever going to want to marry me, you know. Like, Carol says, Betsy, don't you worry about that. <laughs> she said, you just learn about who the Lord is and um, if God wants to, he can bring that man to your front door. Do you remember that? <laughs> and there was Dennis Durr at my front door. Sure enough, he had been there from the beginning. Thank you. I tell, I tell single women that. <laughs> um, now, where was I? Back to, I got saved, Dennis. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I'm going to Grace, and Dennis was my Bible answer man, and we hung out a lot. But we didn't really, weren't interested in each other yet. Um, but he would come over and celebrate Thanksgiving with us. At my first Christmas that I ever celebrated as a Christian, he was there. Um, and then he liked this girl, Alyssa, Alyssa Bates. She was my discipler. And he liked her. <laughs> so I'm like, Alyssa, you know, what do you think about Dennis? And she's like, you know. Craig and Dina, Lloyd, that's you guys who know Craig and Dina, they, they told me I should consider Dennis. So I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, you should consider Dennis. And so I tell Dennis, I say, you got the green light, man. You should just go ask Alyssa, and she will say yes. <laughs> and they started dating. So it was kind of funny because Dennis and Alyssa would come to my house. Alyssa would disciple me. Dennis would take the two young boys to the park and play with them, and then bring them back to my house and take her out on a date. <laughs> and it was okay, because I didn't really like him yet, but like that. And so he was getting to know my boys. And I, then the elders at Grace thought it would be a good idea for me as a widow with two boys to go to join heirs, which was a, a family group. And they thought it would be good for my boys to be exposed to father figures. And um, I didn't like going to that group. It was very awkward for me to be around all these married people. But I thought, I'm going to obey my elders. So I went. And the, one of the first things that happened when I walked in that classroom was that they were going to have a father-child retreat. And that was hard for me. It was really hard for me. So I go and I tell Dennis after church, I'm like, oh man, i got to go to this joint heirs group and they're having this father-child retreat and my kids don't have a dad, you know, and I'm all upset. And Dennis is like, he didn't skip a beat. He goes, I'll take your kids. What? And he did. 
we weren't even dating yet. He took my boys to this camp. Who is this guy? Um, and he drove a station wagon. <laughs> I was like, whoa, he's got a station wagon. He's <laughs> taking my kid. And I said, oh, okay. And he's really, really smart. Dennis is so smart. So smart. And so we started, I don't know at what point he started liking me. He doesn't even know. And it just kind of happened. And he broke up with Alyssa. He, she's married to some other guy, and it's all good. And my birthday, June 14th, 1991. June 14th, 1991. Um, I'm getting ready to go on a retreat with the Northridge Bible study. And Dennis says, well, no, it wasn't. It was in Sino, Sino Bible study. And <laughs> Dennis says, I want to come over and give you, he didn't go to my Bible study, so he wasn't going on this retreat, but he says, I have to stop by and give you a gift. Peter and I have a gift for you, and I'm coming over. I'm like, okay, but I'm packing for this retreat. And he goes, I'll just be a minute. Okay, 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 whatever. He comes over, and he, he gave me this pretty plaque and everything. And I was telling him, I'm like, I was taking this Growing Kids God's Way class, and what I learned that week was that my kids were supposed to call everyone Mr. and Mrs. Now, my kids have been calling everyone by their first name. So I'm like, okay, Dennis, now what do I do? I said, then my kids are so used to calling you Dennis, now they have to call you Mr. Durr. And I'm like, ah, oh. he's like, I have the solution. Let's start dating. <laughs> on this thing, and he says, Betsy, he goes, you know, I um, I wasn't sure about being an instant father, you know, and he goes, but I, I really love your boys, and you're just the neatest, coolest girl I ever met. <laughs> and um, he goes, Betsy, I like you so much, and he goes, no, Betsy, I love you. And I'm like this. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> And he's talking and talking, and I'm like, this cannot be happening. I'm just like, what? And uh, I got to pack for a retreat. <laughs> I'm like, what? And um, he's sitting there, and he's like, yeah. And he goes, I know I've got a house, and you've got a house, and I've got two dogs, and you've got two dogs, blah, blah, blah. And I was just, like, blown away. And after he was all done, I'm like, now what do we do? And he's like, I don't know. <laughs> my sister called up. My sister Leslie, she called and she's wishing me a happy birthday. It was my birthday. And I'm like, Leslie, Dennis just told me he loves me. Here, talk to him. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> no, it wasn't no cell phone. Um, anyway, it was kind of funny. Um, and so we were dating and I, I went on that retreat with the Encino Bible study and I was like, so excited, and I remember everyone telling me two things. First of all, that I was doing the, the dentist dance, and the dentist should not have told me that he loves me without putting a ring on my finger. <laughs> but we got we got around. We, we got past that. Um, I, I got the ring. Um, we got married in March of 1992, and um, Dennis adopted Kevin and Matt. <laughs> And um, together we had Philip. This is my army boy, Philip, and Andrew. And um, we were going to Grace. We went to Grace all throughout the 90s, and we were just learning and growing. I was learning so many things. I love to tell people, you know, I'd listen to John MacArthur, and he's talking about all these big words, you know, sanctification, glorification, justification, and I'd be going, uh, you know, what is all with all these occasion words? I, I'm like writing, I'm like, ah, oh, who knows all these big, huge words, and what do they mean? And I thought, I'll never get this, and I remember thinking, I need a vacation. <laughs> I'm never going to get this, you know? Um, but I, I did, you know, it took a long time, but through all um, these classes I was taking and listening to John, and I would listen to tapes throughout the week and read books and go to classes, and I, I started getting it. And Dennis saw that I was growing, and he saw that I truly was in Christ, and, and he married me. And um, uh, So we were at Grace, and then we um, moved here to Acton. We had a mobile home in a mobile home park in uh, Canyon Country, and we were upside down in the mortgage, and we couldn't sell that house. So someone in the LAPD, I don't remember who it was, 
um, had taken, bought land in Acton and put a house on it, and we thought, oh, maybe we could do that. And we did, and um, by pulling our house out of that mobile home park and bringing it up to land in Acton, we turned over a nice little profit on that house. And we went from being upside down to having a little bit of money, and so then we were able to buy the house that we were currently in. And um, we, we really, really loved it in Acton. And um, the boys had a great time living out here in the, in the dirt and the mountains and riding dirt bikes. And, and Kevin got married in this very church. And um, so it was, it was, we had some really, really good times. And I'm so, so thankful for every dime we spent on the nine cruises Dennis and I were able to take together. <laughs> Or was it eight? Eight or nine? I think it's nine. I think it's nine. It might be a one off by one. Um, we just came back, for those of you who don't know, we just took a cruise in early November, and I'm so, so thankful that we had that time. Um, and just, some of you may not know that my dentist um, is quite brilliant. When he was 16 years old, he designed a computer in his garage, and when... Um, then when he was in his early 20s, he worked for a company called Space Labs, and he designed a heart monitor. He was part of a team that designed a heart monitor, one that was installed in hospitals everywhere. You very well, some of you out there may have been hooked up to a monitor that Dennis Durr designed. He was an engineer, self-taught, and um, he had a commercial pilot's license. And I always wanted, to, I thought my dream date with Dennis Durr would be to fly in an airplane with him while he was playing the trumpet for me. <laughs> too expensive to fly, um, and uh, oh my goodness, I could just go on and on about Dennis and how, the, how many things he could do. He was self-taught, and the latest thing he was working on was Spanish. He was wanted to become fluent in Spanish. He taught himself how to play the bass. He had perfect pitch. He could write out the music for any song. He could play. He knew every... When I started dating him, he would tell me he didn't hear lyrics. I'm like, I am the lyric queen, okay? <laughs> I know lyrics. I'm like, you don't know the lyrics to Amazing Grace, you know, nothing? And he's like, no, but I could tell you every note that every instrument is playing. I'm like, you're weird. <laughs> but he could. He could. He could listen to a song, and he could play. He could write out every note that every instrument was playing. And so it was hard for him to hear the lyrics because he was listening to the notes. Um, I don't have my list in front of me, but... Uh, oh, here we go. Oh, thanks, Joel. Joel was going to do this, but things, things changed. <laughs> oh, yeah, he played a lot of instruments, actually. He started when he was seven years old with the accordion, little Dennis Durr with his big old Coke bottle glasses and <laughs> playing the accordion. And that led to, of course, the piano and the keyboards. He could also play the pipe organ. Um, how many of you have been to the casino in Catalina? Yeah. No one? <laughs> There's a big, huge pipe organ in there. My dentist played that organ. He not only played it, but he tuned and repaired it. Um, he played the flugelhorn. He professionally played the trumpet. He played in big bands. He'd travel all over the country and play his trumpet. He lost his armature, so he didn't play it much um, lately, but he played beautifully. Um, and when he was a teenager, he played in a place in West Valley, I think it was called Pete's Pipe and Pizza, and he used to play the pipe organ there. Um, uh, let's see here, what else can I tell you about my dentist? With the boys, he taught them, he would always call them out to work alongside of him to learn how to pour concrete, dig a hole for a fence post. Um, what else did you guys learn? He cut all their hair, you know, and he cut his own hair, and what? What? <laughs> Chime in, help me out here, I need help. He installed our entire solar system. Um, thank you, Vic, wherever you are, where been helping us get the parts. And, um, yeah, the boys helped, the boys helped, the boys helped, but Dennis figured it all out because he just had that kind of brain. And he learned how to t fix all of our cars just by opening a manual. And he saved us thousands of dollars in all these things that he learned how to do. And um, he also simultaneously and finished his bachelor's degree and began his master's degree in the same semester, taking 32 units. Um, finishing up his bachelor's in biblical exposition at the master's college while beginning his 
Masters of Divinity at the Master's Seminary. And um, he had just married me. We have two kids. I might have been pregnant with our, our first together. I don't know, but it was a crazy semester. <laughs> You know, Dennis Starr, of course, he didn't do seminary in three years. He did seminary in two years. And he graduated with honors. He was also ordained at Grace Community Church, which was quite a process. And um, I was blessed to be able to be a part of that by helping him with flashcards, because I learned a lot just helping him. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we went to the Working Disciples um, Fellowship Group. And Dennis, for um, a couple years after he graduated, seminary pastored that group and he started to feel like being a full-time minister pastor wasn't really what he wanted to do he loved 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 to teach the word of god and he never stopped teaching the word of god he taught the word of god almost every sunday since but he went into law enforcement in june of 1997 dennis went into the lapd um, Oh, for two years he was the interim pastor at this church, and I believe it was six years he taught the evening service here. Um, yeah, yeah, it says so in my notes. <laughs> um, and for the past five years or so, we have been at Church of the Canyons, where he taught a fellowship group called the Faith Builders, and many of you are here today. Thank you all for being here. He absolutely loved the Faith Builders, and it was one of his all-time favorite ministries ever. Um, and I, I could go on and on, but I'm going to stop there. Thank you all so much for being here. Under the circumstances, at one point, I'll tell you the truth. I didn't know if I should even have a service. But I knew that you all would want to be here to see me and my boys. And here you all are, and I, I'm so glad you are. I love you, and I'm so thankful for you. Thank you. Smart guy, but I didn't know he installed the solar system. <laughs> that was pretty funny when I first read that in the notes. It's like I was like, what? Oh, my God. I understand now what she's trying to say. Oh, God. The solar system. Precisely, see. I, uh... <laughs> I'm very grateful for that, those moments of levity and, and being able to rejoice. I'm sure that for most of you guys, you know, your experience is, is like, a, like a lot of folks, that uh, you know your grief comes upon you in really surprising ways. For some folks, it's just like wave after wave after wave down on the shore and you just can't get any relief. For other people, it sneaks up on us. You think you're doing fine, then it's something that triggers a thought, it's a smell, it's a memory, it's a word, it's a song, it's a place. The simplest things can sometimes remind us of the reality of our loss. For some of you guys, you've probably been so busy with arrangements and things like that, you haven't had an opportunity to really process all of this. And For me, just it finally hit me really on on Friday, when I sat down to write out what I had been prayerfully considering and hoping to say today, uh, I opened up a new Word document on my laptop, and I wrote out these words, Dennis Durr's Memorial Service. And then my breath caught in my throat, and I just thought to myself, what in the world? About for a full minute, I sat there and I stared at the words, and my mind's just going crazy. And I thought to myself, Where in the world do you start? Where do you start? And so I thought, You know, Dennis can install a solar system. 
I, I, I want to tell a story of, uh, of how helpful he was to me personally. And I know that you guys have all of those kinds of stories out there as well. Many of you have shared how uh, your life for the gospel has been tremendously impacted because of Dennis's life. I was reminded of a time when Dennis came over to my house to help me move a very large aquarium that I owned. It weighed about 180 pounds dry. That's just the glass. And it had about two inches of wet, crushed coral in the bottom of it. And I think that it took four of us to lift the thing. And we lifted it and we moved it. And then when we went to set the thing down in the new place, somehow Dennis's finger got caught underneath the aquarium and he smashed it. It looked very painful. I think he lost a nail, if I'm uh, not mistaken. But that didn't deter him from being willing to be helpful. And he came over to my house another time later on when I had this great idea that I was going to build a koi pond. And so I built a koi pond and, and he came over and I, somehow we had gotten a cement mixer and some bags of cement and he was going to help me mix the cement and trowel the stuff in. And I'm pretty sure Kevin was there at that time, yeah. And lo and behold, we're mixing the cement and something went wrong and the cement mixer starts to fall over. And I think it fell on Dennis's leg and put him out for the day. It just about broke his leg. Kevin and I finished up the project. But Dennis was like that. Not accident prone, <laughs> but helpful and sacrificial. And he truly loved people that he served alongside and he ministered to. And he was generous and willing to be inconvenienced in order to help folks. You guys know that. And as I said, I'm sure many of you people have your own memories of how Dennis's life impacted yours for good and for the glory of God. And it was interesting because these memories about that, that silly aquarium and my koi pond have been on my mind a lot this summer and this fall because I sold the tank. I sold the tank after 20-something years of using it, and I figured, well, I've got to move it one final time. And so every time that the thing comes down and gets torn down and gets moved, I think to myself, I am getting too old for this. And I think about those days, be careful, don't let the thing smash your finger because it happened to a friend of mine, and so forth. So I kept the fish though, right? And I transferred them into that koi pond because it was summertime, the temperatures are warm, even though these are tropical fish. And I figured it's going to be a great place. They're going to love being in the koi pond for the summertime, and they were uh, very happy to be there. I didn't know also that when fall came and the winters began, excuse me, and the temperature began to uh, drop in the wintertime, I was going to have to go back in that koi pond again and net out all these fish and find warmer water for them. And so I began to net them up and put them in five gallon buckets. And um, as some of you might have heard, that meant that the warmer waters ended up being the old hot tub in the spa room. <laughs> but fish in the hot tub is another story. Here's the point of all of this. Because there really is a point to all of this. When I was netting the fish out of the koi pond, and I couldn't help but think those fish probably thought that being chased and captured in a net and then held in a five-gallon bucket in four inches of water was the end of their life. It was probably the worst thing that fish could imagine, if they could imagine things. But what those silly fish didn't realize was that the very thing they probably wanted, the absolute least in that moment, was actually the best thing for them. I was trying to rescue them. The thing that they thought was going to torture them was actually going to save them. And now I've had the privilege of pre preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ at a number of memorial services. And I understand that at any given time, there are a number of folks who think they've heard it all before. I've heard this. When I stand up and open up the Bible, they look at their watch and say, Whoa, look at the time. I've got to go. You know, I've honored the deceased by my presence here, and I've shown love to the family. I've expressed my condolences. I'll just slip out quietly and avoid the uncomfortableness of what's coming next. Because after all, I'm a good person. I'm a good person. I'm a good person. Better than most people. And I don't want to be told today, on this occasion of my sorrow, that I'm a sinner. Certainly not on a day like today. 
But I would tell you, friends, that if you really want to honor Dennis's memory, if you really want to show love for Betsy and the boys, if you want to honor them, then please humble yourself and consider carefully what I'm going to put before you in the next moments, in the brief two hours we have left. <laughs> My mentor is here today, and, uh, and that means that I can't, I was taught by him to not be even able to say my name in five minutes, so uh, sit back and relax. Because it is this message, and in some way is very hard to hear, is exactly what you need to hear and to heed. If you will, it is the five-gallon bucket here that is going to transfer you from the certainly going to freeze waters of the icy cold death of the koi pond into the warm waters of life. So just bear with me. Be willing to be fish in a bucket. You know, Betsy shared the story of how it was the result of the death of her first husband that really God began to work on her heart and help her to think uh, long and truly about what happens to people when they die. <clears throat> Do we just go into the dirt? Is that all? Does everybody go to heaven? She told us that Dennis, in faithfulness, in that moment, answered with the uncomfortable but sobering truth that after death comes judgment. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. A portion of scripture written by very likely a Jewish believer, two Jews, writes, he says, it is appointed for men to die once. And then after this comes judgment. And friends, there is no reincarnation. There is no transmigration of souls. There is no purgatory. There is no eternal sleep. And there is no annihilation of your soul. There is only judgment. <coughs> and that judgment consists of us standing before God and giving an account of every sinful thought that you and I have ever had, every sinful action that we have ever done. And you know, just because justice is flawed in this life doesn't mean that it's going to be in the next God is not limited like we are. God is not limited by a lack of knowledge. He's not limited by an inability to see. He's not limited by a failing memory. He sees all. He knows all and remembers all of your sins. Even the things that you might think you have done under the cover of darkness when no one is watching, He sees as though it is broad, blazing daylight. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 13, the writer says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of our heart. And then verse 13 says these words. He says, And there is no creature that's hidden from his sight, but all things, all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Every one of us have to do with God. And so I would ask you, because I want to be faithful, I want to be faithful when I stand before my Lord. What will you say in that moment? When the inevitability of your accountability to Him comes to pass, do you content yourself to think that somehow your good deeds in life will outweigh the bad things you've done? That God will say that you are good enough. Oh, that's good enough. We have to recognize that God's standard is not like ours. God's standard is a standard of holiness and absolute perfection. And there is no one who has ever lived, save for one man, the God-man Jesus Christ, who has met that standard of perfection. 
Now it is a common temptation in these circumstances to measure ourselves against other people, right? I'm not as bad as that guy. That lady, man, she's really bad. I would never do something like that. I always try to, and then we talk about the things that we try to do that are good, that makes us feel good about who we are in light of the imperfections and faults and failings of other people. But at the end of the day, all men, the Word of God says, are accountable to God for their sin. And our self-righteousness that boasts in how good we are in comparison to other people that we deem more sinful than us means nothing in God's economy. All of our righteousness, the Word of God says, is like filthy rags. To put it in modern uh, vernacular, not demacular, because that's not even a word, but to put it in modern vernacular, it's like saying that all of our righteousness is like a dirty diaper. It's like you and me taking what we think is the best thing in the world and what we really do is handing to God. We've gone into the nursery and we've dug in the trash and we pulled out a poopy diaper and we said, Here God, this is, this is my righteousness. Guys, that's offensive. On the day when you face God, you will not be able to hide behind your atheism. You will not be able to hide behind your agnosticism. You will not be able to hide behind your intellectual demand for scientific proof. You will not be able to hide behind your intellect. You will not be able to hide behind your education or your philosophy. And you certainly will not be able to hide behind the faults and failings of anyone. Whether they reject Christ or whether they confess Him as Lord. Because our faults, as believers, our faults and failings and sins only serve as an empirical witness to the truth that we proclaim. That we are sinners in need of a merciful Savior. Amen. 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 We need mercy and forgiveness. One day you will die. That's guaranteed. And after that comes the judgment. And you will stand before God and give an account for your sins. And the end result, the Word of God tells us, just to be clear about this, means one of two things. Either you will receive justice. Now isn't it interesting how we want justice? We want justice for the other guy. We want mercy for ourselves. But either you will receive what you deserve, that is, you will receive what is just, you will receive what is fair, and be lost to eternal torment away from his presence. And what Jesus <laughs> describes as burning darkness forever, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, is that you will receive what you don't deserve. You will receive mercy. You will receive forgiveness. There is no third option. There's no second chance. There's no purgatory. Friends and family, beloved people, understand that I'm not here to shame and humiliate you. Every one of us has to come to grips with this reality. I'm saying these things because I want to offer you hope today, true hope. You know, sometimes people have come up to me and they say, Oh, Joel, I'm so sorry about this, that you have to stand in the pulpit and you have to, you have to preside over this memorial service and, and this sad circumstance. And people think I'm nuts. I tell them, to be quite honest, if given the choice, I would rather, I would rather serve people by doing memorial services, even in the most difficult circumstances, than I would preside over marriages. <laughs> to do wedding services. My wife says, what in the world? That's crazy. <laughs> but I believe what the Word of God says in Ecclesiastes 7-2. This is why. <clears throat> Solomon writes, It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. Because that is the end of every man. You look around here, 
at all the faces. A hundred years from now, 75 years from now, will many, if any of us, be alive? It is the end of every man, and the living takes it to heart. So it is my sincere hope that you take these things to heart today. So the question you should be asking yourself at this point is, how can I be saved from the inevitable, eternal consequences of my sin? Because guys, this is not a game. It's not a game. And I am so glad that you asked me that question. Because this is the good news. The, the word gospel means good news. And for the good news to mean anything to you, you have to understand the bad news and recognize the precarious situation that we are in on our own standing before God. Let me just give it to you in a nutshell. In a nutshell, Jesus, the Son of God, was born into this world for the purpose of living a perfect life under the law of God. The Bible tells us that God gave His law to His people. He gave it to them on Mount Sinai. He gave it to them through Moses. And it was written down But the Bible also tells us that there was no way ever that righteousness before God, a right standing before God, could ever come through the works of the law because we all fall short. We sin. We fall short of God's glory. How can we then be justified before God? How then can we be declared righteous before Him? How can we stand before Him? We have to have a righteousness that comes to us from outside of us. A righteousness that is imputed to us. That is, that is charged, credited, I should say, to our account. And so Jesus died as the perfect Lamb of God. Never sinning once in His thoughts or His actions. So that when He died upon that cross, He died as the full and final sacrifice for sin. The book of Hebrews tells us that, that Jesus is the full and final sacrifice to which all of the other sacrifices in the Old Testament pointed. That's why he is called the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And the salvation that God has provided for us through Jesus Christ is not something that we can earn. It's not something like some Folks teach falsely that, that God's grace is, is like God picking up the tab when you and I don't have enough of our own righteousness. After all we can do, grace saves us. No, that's not how it works. God's grace that you means that you and I have to abandon all hope of ever bringing anything into His presence that merits His favor. The grace of God means that we have to throw ourselves upon the mercy and accept God's assessment of our condition. That we're lost in our sin and hopeless apart from Him. The righteousness that Christ provides, the salvation, the forgiveness, the Bible tells us that it is a free gift. It's a free gift that is offered to you and me. And it's a free gift that you and I must receive by faith simply means this, that you and I must be willing to believe what God has to say about us, that we are sinners in need of a Savior. I mean, we must be willing to believe that Jesus is the only way, that He was the Son of God who died on the cross for our sins, and that there is nothing to be added to His sacrifice. It means that you and I must be willing to reach out in faith and receive that gift. It means that we must be willing to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? We have to be willing to surrender the control of our lives to Him. The Bible tells us that He died for all so that they who live would no longer live for themselves, but for Him. 
who died and rose again on our behalf. Jesus assumes that we all come into this world looking for ourselves. <coughs> and then the only hope is that we have to be willing to transfer our allegiance to Him. Jesus, here is the keys to my life. Here are the controls. Here is the title deed. I belong to you. And I can promise you, based on the authority of the Word of God, that if you come to Him for mercy, if you come in faith, no matter how scarlet your sins are, He will make them white as snow. Not only does the Gospel of Jesus Christ give you and me hope for eternal life, that we can go to sleep tonight and we can snore every snore to the glory of God because we know in our heart of hearts that if these are my last breaths, I know I will have confidence before God because of what Christ has done for me. Not only that, guys, the Bible tells us that in Christ, when we are saved, that, that God liberates us from sin's power to control us. You may be struggling with sin in your life and wrestling with things and wonder, why am I always angry? Why do relationships not work out? Why am I enslaved to these desires? Well, you're just living out what the Bible says is true of us. Paul, who was known as Saul to the Jewish church, and he wrote to the Gentiles to explain the ultimate purpose of the law of God given to his Jewish people by God. In Romans 3, 19 through 26, we read now, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. So that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. But God gave his law to the Jewish people to demonstrate to the entire world that even those who had the law couldn't keep it. And so all men, he says, Jews and non-Jews are accountable to God. Why? Because the law was not able to give men a right standing before God because of our sin. The law only served to expose our sin. Compare your life against the Ten Commandments. You probably won't read four words into it until you find that you have broken the law of God. Paul goes on to say, because by the works of the law, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. How is God's righteousness been credited to you and me? Jesus was crucified and his death for sin satisfies the wrath of God toward guilty sinners. We are justified, the word of God says, that is declared not guilty. How? Again, through faith. And for what purpose? The Word of God goes on to say that this was to demonstrate His righteousness. Because in the forbearance of God, He passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of His righteousness at the present time. So that God, so that He would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. In other words, to say it like this, that there is no injustice in God's mercy. Because the penalty has been paid. It has been paid by Jesus so that justice is served upon your sins and my sins. The beauty of the gospel is that he suffered in our place. That is how God can be both just, that is righteous and just, and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Friends, you guys have been very gracious uh, to stay in this five gallon bucket of water with four inches. But unlike the fish, you have a choice in front of you. You can't choose this, choose to heed this message to repent and receive Jesus and his offer of mercy and forgiveness and the eternal life in him to continue our analogy, you can choose, if you will, the warm waters and shelter of the hot tub this winter. Or you can take your chances back in the koi pond. Because we will all leave today. And we'll go on and we'll think our things and our thoughts and we'll do our stuff. But just don't tell yourself that you haven't been warned. 
Because even though the sun may be shining today and the temperature is balmy and the water fairly warm for this time of year, remember, winter is coming. The temperature will drop, and the water will freeze, and the fish will perish. And you may say to yourself, you know, I'll think about that. Maybe what I'll do is I'll stay in the pond a little bit longer until it gets a little bit colder. I'm begging you on behalf of Christ, on behalf of Dennis, on behalf of his family, to not walk away from this place today without doing business with God. Because you have to understand that you are not promised tomorrow. The writer of Hebrews says it this way in chapter 3, verses 7 through 8, with a warning. He says, Do not harden your hearts. Today, if you hear His voice, don't harden your hearts as in the day of rebellion when they tested me in the wilderness for four years. Thank you so much for being here today. We have a closing song. And I want to introduce to you those who are going to be playing that as they make their way up to the platform to get their instruments. I think that's you. Playing. <laughs> These are dear friends and family who've been playing music together for uh, a long time. And uh, the name of the song is called Forever Rain, Forever Rain.
this time, I'm going to close us in prayer. And then, uh, we'd like to let you know that there are refreshments that are here. And want for you to please stay and greet some folks and uh, see people you haven't seen in a long time. And make sure to come alongside Betsy and, her, and our, their lovely family and uh, speak those words of encouragement and comfort. <coughs> Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this day and thank you for the opportunity that we have had as the children of God to be reminded, Lord, that even in the midst of difficult circumstances, that you are still God. To be reminded that there is more mercy in Christ than there is sin in any one of us or all of us put together. And so we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you bore our sins upon the cross, Lord, and that you give us hope, that you give us peace in the midst of these storms, Lord. We pray from this moment forward that every one of us would consider our lives, we would consider your holiness, and we would be committed more and more to letting our light shine among men so that they may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. Again, we thank you, Jesus, for paying all of our sins. In your name we ask these things and pray. Amen. Amen. I believe what the plan is, is that we're going to move these chairs away and set up tables.